Hi friends, so we are back in studio for another episode of The Period Feels. Um, this is Nadia Okamoto speaking. I am the co-founder and CEO of August, and I was supposed to be here with a couple of members of our team, but there is some sort of cold flu bug going around New York City right now, um, and quite a bit of our team is out sick, so uh, unfortunately I am going to be riding solo on this one, but I am super excited to be introducing you to someone who has been a very big part of of my life for several years now, and that is my co-founder and COO, Nick Jane. So Nick and I actually met several years ago. He was the co-founder and COO of Juve Consulting, which is a leading Gen Z marketing agency that he started at the age of 16. And as y'all know a little bit of my background and story, I also accidentally fell into Gen Z marketing several years ago and met Nick through that world and eventually joined his company as chief brand officer. And before August, we were co-leading that company together. And I think that's really when we were able to not only become friends, but also just get to um, share a lot of notes and experiences and thoughts and frustration with each other on how we thought the period industry could be different. And naturally, if you're going to be friends with me, you're going to hear a lot about periods and a lot about my ideas on how we can make periods a more positive conversation. So when um, you know I started obsessing over this beginning idea of August, Nick was the friend that I was turning to to tell all about it. And there was no other consideration of a potential partner, co-founder, business partner, um, COO than Nick Jane. Um, he, uh, he and I split our roles very, very well. I think one of the reasons we are perfect co-founders for each other is that I am so creative focused. I'm very focused as CEO on the overall company vision and creative and marketing, community, how we tell the story to the outside world so people know what August is all about. Nick is the COO. That means he's chief operations officer, meaning he's really the one behind the scenes making sure it all happens and making sure that our big dreams become a reality. So I'm going to be sitting down with him and asking him a lot of questions that I've heard from our community. That includes talking about fundraising, supply chain, um, and all these questions that I feel like we don't really talk about on social media very much. Um, and I'm going to pretend like I don't know the answers to this, uh, but I hope that this is one of many, many future converse conversations to come um, talking to Nick Jane, my co-founder. So let's go. Hi friends, we are so excited for this episode. Uh, we have a lot in store and you actually get to meet someone who's very, very important at August who you haven't met before. So with that, let's dive into another episode of The Period Feels. Thank you so much, Nick. That's Nick Jane, my co-founder. Um, and yeah, he is someone who really holds the whole ship together of August, but um, isn't often on camera with us on TikTok or in the podcast. So this episode is all about meeting Nicholas Jane. So Nick, welcome to The Period Feels. Thank you. Tell me a little bit about what your role is at August. Um, I think I think my role is is to take everything that you guys are doing on on TikTok and saying on TikTok and to make it happen. So you know all of the back end stuff of you know building the product, getting the product to people, making sure that we don't run out of money. Um, <laughs> you know those important things. And what is your official title? Uh, COO. And do you get a period? I do not. So you are the only non-menstruator on the team. As of now, yes. As of now. And we get a lot of questions online about like why you would be interested in this, how you came to even w run a company about periods. Can you talk a little bit about your journey to August? Yeah. I mean, I, I think my, my journey started at my last company, um, which was uh, a, a marketing agency that helped brands, campaigns, nonprofits, et cetera, better understand and reach uh, Generation Z. And I think what was really interesting is, as you know, um, you joined that team, <laughs> you know, a few years in um, as our chief brand officer. And I think that um, in, in getting to know you and hearing everything that you had to say about periods all the time, and also, you know, working with brands um, in this space and hearing what other young people had to say about the brands and the experience and the products, it made me realize that we you know, uh, that, that like this space is one that is, you know, truly missing the mark, especially when it comes to younger consumers. And so um, I think I, we were hearing from so many, I don't know if you remember, we were hearing from so many young menstruators that like they hated the products, they hated the brands, they didn't feel any connection to brands. And, um, and then, you know, when we started doing our deeper dive, we saw like 
there is so little emphasis on sustainability in this space. There is mm-hmm. so little emphasis on like true quality of product in this space, on comfort, on innovation. Um, and, and then, you know, on, on building a brand that was inclusive and that was empowering rather than one that perpetuated stigma. And so once I saw all of that, even though I didn't get a period, I also, you know, I saw that there was a, a huge potential to create impact. Um, and I think, you know, I, I'm a big believer that like you shouldn't do things for the sake of doing them. You should do things because if they can actually create, you know, something that doesn't exist or to create impact. And I really thought that, um, this was a space that, that was ripe for that. Kind of touching on your previous work experience. I'm 24, so I'm your elder. How old are you? I'm tw- uh, 22, but I'm turning 23 next week. Yeah, next week. turning About to turn 23. You started your career a long time ago. This is your second company. Where did your whole like passion for Gen Z youth engagement begin? It started really when I was in high school. I... I weirdly enough, got very interested in educational policy when I was in high school. I, you know, I was reading about, you know, cases like, it, you know, throughout the country of, of discrimination that was, you know, taking place in schools, particularly racial and religious discrimination. I think, you know, at that time when we were in high school, there were started, there started to be a lot more reported events um, of, of discrimination taking place in schools. I also witnessed some in my own school, and I started getting really curious about how you know, how we could combat, combat that, right? Like, what were actual policymakers and legislators doing to create change to avoid that happening in the future? And I think in getting interested about that, I, I reached out to a bunch of politicians, like local assemblymen, et cetera, a um, n- number of nonprofits to try to get involved um, in, in better understanding educational policy. And I found myself, you know, in a bunch of rooms with people who are actually making decisions. Mm-hmm. And I think for me, like kind of a, a, a turning point was I was interning at a, at a nonprofit in DC the summer before my senior year of high school. And I got invited through the nonprofit I was working for, I got invited to a round table at the White House um, with the Secretary of Education and a few other, you know, high, uh, high profile leaders in government. And the sole topic of conversation was how to reduce um, racial and religious discrimination in schools. And I remember I walked into this big room, I was sitting at the back and, um, you know, watching these, you know, 50, 60 year old politicians talk, mostly white men talk about, you know, 16, 17 year olds and, and what they needed and how, you know, we could create systems in schools to avoid discrimination. And it made me realize like, how can you possibly make effective decisions about people who are 30, 40 years younger than you when you're not actually including them in that conversation? Um, and I think at that point I started seeing it everywhere. You know, I saw it in the products that brands were making. I saw it in the brands themselves. I saw it in, you know, just a lot of the decisions that were being made at high, at the highest levels of these organizations. Um, and it made me realize that there was, you know, a huge opportunity to actually create things that resonated with Gen Z and that worked for a younger consumer by involving that younger consumer in that decision-making process. And so that was kind of how Juve was born. We grew that for, I mean, I, I was there for about four and a half years um, before we stepped down to, to build August. And at Juve, your role was also COO. Yeah. What do you think, like, Juve really taught you that you're now taking into August? I mean, I think it's, it's really interesting because they're completely different. Mm-hmm. Like, I think that when you look at, like, the operations of, a, of an agency or a services-based company is, like, it, you know... I, I, it's a lot of people management and project yeah. management. I think with with August, there's so much more than that. There's a lot of, I mean, there's inventory management. There's global supply product, chain, yeah, <laughs> supply chain. There's product development, and then and then there's you know the, also the project and people management. And I think that, um, but I think I think more than anything, like starting a company at age 16, when you know you're basically going and meeting with like Fortune 500 C-suite level executives and telling them to give you like thousands of dollars in marketing <laughs> budget. Um, without having any experience in marketing or anything. I think it, it taught me like how to problem solve. It taught me like how to be scrappy. And I think it, it taught me how to think about, you know, these problems from, from an early age. I think something that I, that I realized was like, you know, I, I, I realized that we were building so many ideas at Juve for these brands that, w- and the brands weren't implementing them or they're implementing mm-hmm. them incorrectly. And I think that, you know, through that, it, it taught me the rough outline of how these brands were being built um, but it also taught me what not to do. And so I think there's just a lot of learnings that I was able to take from that. But I would also say that like I, half of my role right now I've learned in the last two years and I'm yeah. still learning, right? Like I, I don't, I, I, we're reacting to things in real time that like, 
you know, I've never experienced, but I've also come to realize that I don't think most founders have experienced a lot of this stuff. I, you know, most founders, you know, you kind of just go and you have to just have this perseverance that like, no matter what gets thrown at you, you figure out a way around it. Um, Isn't it crazy to think that we're two years in? It's, it's wild. Yeah. Like I, it's, it's been a, a, it's been both a very long and very short two years, but like two years it's an uh, pandemic years too. Yeah. It's so yeah. crazy. I mean, I think that one of the things I was really excited to talk to you about on this podcast is really around that the supply chain and operation perspective, because obviously what people see online is so based on the brand and talking about like the product result, right? Like how great, obviously we're biased, but how wonderful the products are, um, what they feel like, how they work. But when you and I began this journey in January, 2022, um, we, really, I think I remember sitting down being very aware of what we had no idea what the fuck we were doing specifically around inventory, supply chain, fundraising, and all of those things. So I kind of want to start by dissecting really like what the steps were in creating what is now August, right? So first step we had to fundraise. And I think that uh, as we shared with the world last year, we ended up raising a pre-seed round of about $2 million. Um, I know, but I would love for you to share with other people. I think a lot of times when, um, you know, the general public hears we raised $2 million, they assume you and I are rolling in dough as co-founders and we are like a profitable up and running startup who raised millions of dollars, right? But when in reality, $2 million makes us a scrappy direct-to-consumer business. So for the general general public and our listeners out there, like, what does it mean to raise two million and what does that two million go to? Yeah. I mean, I, I would say that, I mean, I'd say that it, both are, are very good questions and, and very misunderstood. I think, I, I think we misunderstood it when we were going out and doing it. I remember when we first started, we had these like lofty ideas of what, you know, two and a half million dollars would get us. Or well, we thought dollars. originally we were going to raise like 200,000. Yeah. Well, well, we went back and <laughs> forth. At first we were like, we we're like, we're going to raise two and a half million and this will get us the world. And then we we're like, no, we're going to be scrappy and raise 200,000. And like, the truth is that like, you know, neither was true, right? Like, you know, we, we ended up raising closer to the two and a half million. It certainly did not like get us, you know, everything that we thought we would need. And we're, you know, you know, we're still, you know, need more at this point. And I think, I think what 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 is difficult to to comprehend is like you know I, like I think that it's important for companies to be scrappy it's important for companies to have a path to profitability I think that Juve, our, our, you know, the, our last company, I think, you know, we never raised any money. So mm -hmm. what it meant was that any growth that we had had to come from, you know, our own revenue. And um, that takes a lot of time. So before you can hire another employee, you need to make enough money off of clients to get, you know, to, to be able to afford to pay them, right, and to make mm -hmm. payroll. And I think with, with August, like the benefit of raising money is that you're able to grow your company a lot faster. You're able to hire the right people to help, you know, grow be to, to grow the company i think with a direct-to-consumer company you also are able to pay for the product itself which is mm -hmm. something that like i think you know people sometimes forget is that we're not drop shipping this product right we're not like you know you're not going online ordering the product and then we're going and like you know making it in a in a factory somewhere and shipping it out we're purchasing the hundreds of thousands of units of product at once and you know we're you know we're spending like hundreds of thousands of dollars on the product itself and i think especially for our product because we wanted to make it a higher quality more sustainable product we're we had to spend way more on it we had to you know order in larger volumes we had to you know spend more on a per unit basis um and so that meant that like even before we had made a single dollar in revenue we had spent hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars um just building the product you know, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, then you have the packaging, you have everything that goes alongside, you know, that, that product that you get every single piece of it from like the tampon itself to the wrapper, to the box, to the outside box, like that's a cost that we mm -hmm. incurred as a company. Um, even before, you know, a single person bought that tampon. Um, and I think, I, I think in addition to that, like, you know, then you have a team, right? We have a team of, of seven people right now and it's growing because, you know, we're trying to keep up with, you know, the demand that people have for the product, right? Like we're, mm -hmm. we, we need to have people that respond to customer care inquiries. We need to have people that create the TikToks that, you know, people see to like become aware of our brand and go buy their product, right? We need to, um, I mean, all of that is, is an expense. And so, you know, when it comes to, to, to you know, the, you know, the benefits that you and I each personally get, like, 
you know, something that most people don't realize is we, Nadia and I didn't even pay each, pay ourselves until like what a year and a half in to, to the company. Yeah. And, you know, even then, like our priority was making sure that our team, you know, was, was able to get paid well before that. And that, you know, we were, I mean, from day one that we were able to pay our team, um, and, and that we were able to pay competitive living wage salaries rather than, you know, what, what some companies do and, 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 you know, offering the promise of future payment or, mm -hmm. you know, the promise of future equity. Um, yeah. How long is, was the 2 million supposed to last? I think when we, when we first raised it, I mean, the first thing is that we raised it kind of over the course of a year, a mm -hmm. year and a half, right? Like we raised it between, between March of 2020, right when everything was imploding to, we closed it in June of 2021. So about a year yeah. and three months, right? And I think that, you know, before we had even closed the last of the two million, we already spent, you know, a third of it. Yeah. Right? I think when we when we finally closed, we had like 1.2, 1.3 million in the yeah. bank, which means we'd already spent seven hundred thousand um, dollars. So I, I think that it was meant from there. You know, I was expecting, I was hoping it would last twelve to eighteen months. Um, that's you know kind of what we were telling ourselves. And part of the goal with that is like we wanted to see a full year worth of yeah. data around August, you know, how August was growing, how sales were going, what was working, right? And um, before we went out and raised again. Now, it, that didn't end up happening. Um, I think that, you know, truthfully, it, pro it seems like the way it's turning out, it, we would have lasted almost exactly 12 months on the money that we raised. But, you know, it, I, I, think, I think that you obviously also, you, you, you can't run the risk of running out of money before you raise again. So that's why we're, we're doing that. I think another really undervalued or like a part of the business that we don't talk about at all publicly is like the budgeting and legal side of it, which you kind of are a one man show in owning on the August team. So I think that that, I mean, that to me, I think when we worked together at the last company together was always something that I was really impressed by, which is like, uh, here's a guy who basically is like teaching himself how to review legal contracts and of course work with lawyers and speak this language that one I don't really have the attention span for or like the skill of yeah and I, I mean I think again it was like it was like goes back to I you know the fact that I'm really grateful that we didn't raise money at Juve because I yeah. think that when you raise money especially when you start to raise lots of money I think it's easy to start to pay for a lot of these things. And mm -hmm. I think that it's easy to, you know, say, okay, I raised $2 million. I'm going to spend, you know, I'm going to spend on the best lawyers, the best accounts. And at a certain point you have to do that. Like we're yeah. getting to the point where like, we need to do that to make sure that like, we're not missing anything. Right. And that we're protecting the company and that, you know, we're making sure that we're not making any mistakes that could cost us a lot more. Um, but I think at the early days, like, uh, you know, at Jew, for example, we didn't have, there's a point where we, you know, we were operating on less than five thousand dollars in our bank account and we had people to pay and we had contracts that we thought were going to be signed but that hadn't been signed or contracts that hadn't been paid that yeah. were invoices due and we couldn't go out and afford to pay a thousand dollars an hour or five hundred dollars yeah. an hour on legal fees so i taught myself roughly how to like understand contract law at, on a very cursory level so that I could, you know, read through a contract, understand what points needed to be addressed and didn't. And so when we hired, when we, when we did need to bring a lawyer in to review something, I could, you know, break it down very clearly for them and say, Hey, like we need help on this clause. And that meant that like, rather than paying for six hours of their time, we paid for one. Um, yeah. And I think, you know, that taught me a lot coming into August about what, you know, what I, what I could do myself, what I needed help for. Um, you know, it, finances are a very similar thing, right? Like I, I, I used to joke at, at Juve, I was the COO, CFO, and chief legal officer all at the same time. And, you know, in August, I, I, I play a, a similar role. Um, but, I, but I think that it, it, you know, if you spend enough time at something, I think you, you can get a handle of, 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 of how it works. And again, I, I, I'm, I'm constantly learning every yeah. day. Well, let's kind of lean into that, which is like, I mean, you in your role have really overseen designing the supply chain, product development, even like how you get products made in another country through customs and everything. Like what has the learning curve been like and where did you turn to learn? Like advisors, yeah. mentors? Okay. okay. Yeah, I mean, it's it, the learning curve, um, it's definitely been steep. I, I think that it's it's been, um, 
yeah, I came into this knowing nothing about supply chain, but I think you're, ex- you know, you're, you're absolutely right. I think that the first step was advisors, right? We were fortunate to have some of the best advisors and investors in the world. I think part of our strategy was to get fine people that knew exactly what they were doing and had done this for years, right? We found experts in supply chain, people that had built supply chain for the largest direct to consumer companies mm. in the world and, and had them, you know, uh, invest in us and advise us. And we learned a lot from them. I think, and I think beyond that, it's also just a lot of learning through doing, right? Like you, you, uh, you, once you like go through these experiences a couple of times, you start seeing like, okay, you know, this is something that really worked. This is something that didn't work. This is something that like, I'm going to be able to learn for next time. Right? Like yeah. we sold out for two months, I mean a month, a little bit more than a month in um, February, March of this year. And you know, a big reason was because like we were, tr- I was trying to time our inventory, you know, exactly so that we would, we would be able to conserve cash. I thought, you know, if I can order inventory at the last possible point to make sure that it gets here on time, then, you know, we're not going to have to pay more money up front. We're not going to have to pay for warehousing costs, all of yeah. that. But the problem is I didn't anticipate there being COVID outbreaks in our factories, right? I didn't anticipate the fact that like getting product from China to the U.S., just takes twice as long as it used to and costs twice as much. And so when it came down to it, like we weren't able to get the product here fast enough. And as a result of that, like, you know, we we had to deal with a lot in terms of like, you know, keeping, you know, making sure that that we were able to restock as fast as possible. And so that's a mistake that, you know, I I made that I, you know, that I've learned from and that I know what to do next year when we get, you know, or the next time that we get into a period where we have to reorder product. For sure. Okay, I have one last question, which is, what is your favorite thing about leading August? Um, I mean, I think it's I think it's 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 probably it's probably that right. Like it's probably just just constantly learning things that like I I didn't know before. And I think it's you know I wouldn't say my favorite thing is making mistakes because that <laughs> isn't fun. But I would say that like it's it's one of those things where I've you know in the last two years I've learned. I think I've learned more than I ever have in my entire life about anything, you know, Mm -hmm. just because like I now have a whole other, you know, realm and an ecosystem of things that I, you know, have have just had to learn and had to basically perfect. Um, And I'm far from perfect. I'm still learning. But I think that um, I think it's really exciting to build something where like you're building yourself along the way. And so like my I'm just really I'm just every day I, I, I wake up and I just learn more. Um, and it just makes me a better founder, a better leader, you know, for, for August and, you know, anything else in the future. Love that. Um, where can people find you on social? I mean, I, I have, I have. Or Nick's like, I don't want to be found. <laughs> I, 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 I'm not very active on social, but I'm at Nixie Jane on Instagram and I don't really, I, I don't have active profiles in any of the other platforms um anyways uh we will definitely have you back i have so many other questions um and i know um our audience has a lot of questions for you too but i'm so glad you were able to come and join me in studio yeah me too thank you so much y'all for listening to another episode of the period feels y'all don't understand how big of a deal it is that i got nick to do that little jingle with me so we're celebrating that anyways we are back every single tuesday with a new episode find us on social it's august it's august co on tiktok website it's august.co and if you want to join our community just click join inner cycle on our website See y'all next Tuesday.